Too many who know the angles Uncover and untangle All the questions and the webs left out to tangle I'll be in 1962 Last Wednesday's afternoon They'll bend your ears with reckless self-abandoned The amazing spider talk The amazing spider talk Come swing the air, sit back and prepare For the amazing spider I'm Dapper Dan Gavostin, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which definitely count. And I'm Mischievous Mark Chinacchio, and I, too, own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, but the annuals, they do not count. Welcome to the Amazing Spider-Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. Thanks for joining us for this review episode of the Amazing Spider-Talk. Today on the show, Dan and I are going to be discussing Amazing Spider-Man, Volume 5, number 69, number also known as Legacy number 870. This story is entitled Chameleon Conspiracy Part 3. This issue was written by Nick Spencer and Ed Brisson, with pencils by Zay Carlos, Carlos Gomez, and Marcelo Ferreira, inks by Zay Carlos, Jose Gomez, and Wayne Foucher, colors by Andrew Crossley and Ma- Maury Hollowell, and letters by VCs Joe Caramanga. The cover is by Mark Bagley, John Dell, and Brian Reber. This issue was first released on June 23rd, 2021. What's new? All right, Mark, let's get in with part three of a four part arc here in the chameleon conspiracy. What that conspiracy is, is still beyond me. Three out of the four parts into it. You know, I guess we're kind of seeing things dovetail, but but even then, (laughs) that is I was going to say, like, yeah, I mean, there's a finisher conspiracy and then there's some stuff going on with like chance and and the jack-o'-lantern and and the clairvoyant. But but. I mean, the chameleon has a presence in this, but yeah, I mean, if this is some kind of master plan, I- I'm not seeing it, Dan. It's just kind of it's this stuff that's happening that the chameleon is observing. I mean, you know, he's an observer in the way that Spider-Man is an observer, it seems a lot in his own comic. So there you go. Well, that's a great place to start. I mean, we really dragged the last issue. And I, I think I texted you before you had a chance to read this. Uh, this one's a little bit better than that one. But like, I think upon rereading it, like if it's better, it's only better in like the most marginal way possible in that Spider-Man is a more pronounced presence in this title and feels like he's actually engaging with whatever we're reading here. Still not entirely sure, but whatever we're reading. Yeah, I mean, I think your exact text to me when this came out was there's some cool Spidey fight scenes. And that's that's true. I mean, there's some good action in this. I mean, which is an improvement from last time. But, you know, we're, we're basically getting into the end game with Nick Spencer's run here. And it does make you wonder, like, you know, intent was this intentional to kind of be closing in on his on his arc with this story? Because this is this this feels like total fluffy transitional stuff that, you know, would have maybe been more suitable two years ago when we were trying to transition from one big arc to the next. And instead, it's just kind of like, wait, this is this is this is something that's wrapping threads up, which I guess it kind of is. But they're not really the threads that I personally was looking to be wrapped up. I mean, a.k.a. Teresa Parker. This is where we're at, Dan. I mean, this is this is this is this is the story. And this is where we're focusing the attention of a book that's shipping twice a month plus with the giant size right now i mean i i I, so you either gotta really love this or you're gonna probably just end up sounding like us i'll say i did not love this issue i'm not really entirely sure what i'm reading in this issue it's just kind of all over the place and this i have to say just behind the scenes this is the least amount of notes i've ever written on an issue which is probably an indication of my enjoyment of it i think last time i said if the ends justify the means I wasn't trying to test my cosmic fate 
by suggesting that, you know, like I just want a well-told story. And right now we have what seem to be three kind of like uh, of loosely told, I wouldn't even dare call them stories. You know, they are things that are happening and I don't really care much about anyone involved in them, including Spider-Man. So, um, you know, the first story we kind of check in on here is the finisher who promises to finally tell Teresa the truth about her past. Will he do it in this issue? Of course not. It'll be in the next issue. But he'll keep talking about it. (laughs) Yeah, we assume it'll be in the next issue. But sure, fine. So then we we switch back to Spider-Man fighting all of the various villains that lined up. Mark, I want to see if you can name the villains who are involved in this fight scene. It's not terribly memorable, Dan, but I mean, there's there's Chance, there's Jack Lantern. Who else is there, Dan? Help me out here. Uh, well, don't forget about Slide and the uh, yes. and uh, the the uh, uh, the Foreigner. Yes, the Foreigner, not the band. Although that would be far more interesting, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, the, the, a lot of like. 80 mid 80s d-list stuff here going on here i mean jack and lantern maybe not be totally d-list but i mean certainly these other characters here i mean this like, like again not to keep going back to this arc this arc this arc but like we are literally telling a story about d-list characters here like 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 this is again like this is what we're focusing on like stories with the foreigner and the finisher and and chance and and slide i mean come on like this is this this is the best we can do now like uh, anyway and i i let's get to the the, to back to the finisher in a in a bit because i have i have a rant prepared about this with with when he starts talking to the flashbacks annual five do you want to there anything else you want to say about this fight scene here before we get back to that or do you want to me just to go right to my rant well i mean it's sort of this classic self-aware things where spider-man's mocking how d-list these characters are and it's like i get it but i'd rather read a story where there's characters i care about you know i like the smashing pumpkins joke i thought that was kind of funny we we kind of see like Jamie's true colors come out, you know, now that we're supposed to be sympathetic about Jamie and his family and all that stuff, Jamie does blast Spider-Man right as a, uh, you know, final moment and leave with them. So I guess Jamie's colors are showing. Okay. So we turn the page and the finisher is kind of doing one of this classic Nick Spencer's info dumps on the backstory of a character you hardly know anything about. The finisher is a character from Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number Five. It's actually a character we've joked about on the show. I think, t- like the character is so F-list that you and I have never really referred to him by his name, the finisher. He was just the guy that got blown up with by a missile in a in a way that made Spider-Man kind of his murderer. But instead, we get a retcon here. So, Mark, go on your rant. Okay, so this is this is the thing, and like, yes, we have joked about this story a lot and like we have even like i think even commented made made the comment that the finisher himself makes in this comic which is like wow for someone who doesn't have a no kill code spidey sure did try to kill this guy right i mean yeah. we made that joke but like when i read that in this comic it it maybe maybe i'm being unfair here but it kind of like opened up my eyes with something that i have consistently found to be the problem with Spencer's run here. And, and, you know, a lot of people, and and frankly, I think it's something that I, that a lot of people praise him for, which is like Spencer's, I think sometimes obsession with fixing continuity that maybe some people are asking to be fixed, but like, not really like, like, you know, like we, we've, we've dealt with this when we talk about like the sin eater, we've talked about this when we, we, we talk, I mean, like, okay, fine. He, he, he did make he did remedy the black cat situation, which I think was was important. But like even stuff with Craven and bringing Craven back when he wanted to be dead this whole time, and and how Hunted kind of put the, put a bow on that. I think that Spencer sometimes to you know what is what has really limited his ability to tell good stories is his infatuation with focusing on things that you know he and probably other fans find to be incorrect about spider-man this shouldn't be and like i'm going to just start making a whole story about fixing this and i think that's what we're getting here it's like i feel like 
here is this character that just got this comically illogical end that doesn't mesh with anything with Spider-Man's character. But guess what? It's Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number Five. The story was told what 50 years ago now 55 years ago like who who here is sitting there being like no no we we need to find out like spider-man should would wouldn't kill spider-man shouldn't have killed we can't just have it end like this and i feel like this this like need to like no 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 i'm gonna fix it i'm gonna make this better i'm gonna i'm gonna it's like it it's it's regret to me it's regressive it's regressive storytelling we're not moving spider-man the character's narrative forward in any kind of meaningful way. We're just going back and 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 changing the decorations on on continuity and and like to me like that's just it gets boring to read after a while. Like you want to fix a couple of things, I get it, but like he's just so Spencer is just so obsessed with putting other people's toys back in the box. Just give it up, man. Like find another mission. Like this is this it's it's lame. I'm sorry. Like you 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 sound like the angry nerds on the message board when you do stuff like this. I just have to say it like I just I really find this to be regressive and and tiring with it to constantly be reading these stories and being like, oh, I guess we're going to revisit this story from umpteen years ago now because Spencer can't let it go. It's funny because I think oftentimes the online voices are yelling about how editorial is keeping the character in a state of arrested development. But it's hard to make that argument in in this case when you look at something like Dan Slott's run, which took the character in, uh, some people would argue, maybe too many different directions, like making him a CEO or something, even if it wasn't fated to last for a very long time. And and, and I'll say that that's not the kind of progression I was looking for for the character. Like, I just want Spider-Man to live Peter Parker's life and and develop the natural threads of, of where that story is going. And I almost feel like maybe like if, if that were true, that they don't actually know what to do with Peter, then maybe the only way to go is to go backwards. You know, like if you can't go forwards, why not mind the past endlessly? But like you can't really like when when, when Dan Slots run it, so few of that, it you know, with all of its own problems, you know, you have to think this is, attributed squarely to nick spencer and 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 you and you begin to wonder like yeah how much of this book's regressive nature is truly just a writer that doesn't want to take it in in that direction And, and and i'll say it's not all backwards you know sometimes it's backwards to go forwards like the mary jane stuff is to me backwards to go forwards yeah i mean in a sense but when you think about it like and i guess we'll find out in a few months just how true this ends up being but like the entire like thesis of Spencer's run is, seems to be centered around this idea of fixing brand, uh, one more day. And you're just like, like, like he's, he has spent three years to, to undo that and to fix that. And you're just kind of like, there's gotta be a better way to tell stories than that. You can't just focus all of your major thematic plot beats on undoing the past and not just undoing the past, but undoing I can't even say these are controversial things. Like these are just like, these are just, I don't know. Like I, I'm probably not making a ton of sense right now. It's, it's, it's a work night and I'm a little fried from the day, but like, <laughs> I, I just feel that sometimes you got to go backwards to go forwards, but I don't know how forward we're truly going here. Cause I, I, all I'm seeing is, okay. You know, like I said, hunted fix the Craven's last hunt or not hunt uh, Craven's last hunt. It fixed, um, what do you call it? Grim Hunt, thank you. You know, the, the first part of Last Remains fixed stuff from the Sin Eater arcs and, uh, you know, not, not Defigy and the Wolf, but the following one. You know, now we're, now we're getting into One More Day and Brand New Day. I, I, to me, like, this is, this is just, like, so much, so much being focused on I must fix. And it's like, I don't know, man, just tell, tell stories, man. Tell, tell stories about going forward. Like how is, how is Spider-Man operating within this status quo going forward? Not, not going backwards. And it's funny because as much as we rant about this, there's an equal number or maybe more people. uh, And that's why you said like, you're like, it's like a forum came to life and is writing this, you know, I, I, if I have to read one more take about like how we should be spending this much time undoing one more day, you know, I, I, I will, I don't know what the, how to end that metaphor, but there are plenty of people that like, feel like this is exactly what, 
the book should be doing. And I, I, I just don't think that the, the ends are justifying the means if, if whatever the ends end up being. And, and I would say, okay, great. If that's what you want to do, but like, yeah, like you're saying, we got to look forward and, and it is, it is very looking backwards and, and that's just not fun stories to read. Yeah. I mean, the fact is we don't have a ton to say about this issue. So this is, this is filling the time on the clock here for us, but like, you know, we we've said this before, so I apologize for the broken record elements of it, but like, yes, brand new day came out of a storyline that we have both, both agreed was poorly executed in, in, in one more day, but Brent, but you and I have both been on the record and saying we like brand new day because they just told fun move forward looking stories. And like, that's, that's to me, like the epitome of what Spider-Man should be. Like, you know, to me, that was one of the most fun eras of Spider-Man because like it was, you were always looking forward to the next thing. Like the, 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 nothing, nothing was steeped in this like backwards history of, oh, we got to go back and redo this, you know, like outside of maybe like Harry's resurrection, which we're now getting, <laughs> which, which we're now coming back and probably fixing that too. It sounds like, well, uh, I mean, I think we would agree that that like is one of the weaker stories in brand new day. You yeah. Know? Like, I, oh, absolutely. I, yeah. If, if we were involved in editorial, God willing, uh, or God, God bless everybody else, I don't think we would have told that Molten Man, Harry Osborne story in the same way. We would have just had him come back with the snap, you know, or, or, the, or the, the deal. So the snap is Thanos. I don't know what I'm talking about. It, yeah, it's whatever. It's the same kind of magic. For me, it was just that those were stories. Like, there was a beginning and middle and end to those stories. And here we're just kind of just biding our time until we can retcon the next thing. That's the big thing. I think you could do all this and tell a story and I would care. And I guess we'll see when that part four comes out, if this kind of wraps itself up in an interesting way, but I don't even know that I feel like the stakes have been set yet. I don't know what this story is about. Well, moving forward with that. So, um, you know, after we find out, obviously, that the finisher did not die at the hands of the missile, but said that the chameleon helped nurse him back to health. Then we, the lizard shows back up and the, and the lizard is there to, to tell Spider-Man where Jamie went. What, what did you think about the lizard's appearance here? And, and, and was there anything in there that you think is important for future storytelling in the scene? Well, I mean, to me, this is just an example of like another kind of sloppy part of the story, which is like. Oh, it's just a page of the lizard showing up. Does it have anything to do with the narrative thrust of this uh, story? No. All the lizard does is show up for a full page to tell him where Jamie went. You know, that could easily be handled, you know, use that page for some other thing, you know, like have Spider-Man swinging off and be like, thank God Kurt was there. He told me, you know, whatever. And, and use that page space for something else. We don't need a whole page of the lizard there for no reason it just doesn't do anything for the story we learned that he has like a new non-aggression trip which like maybe i'm forgetting how hunted ended but like i thought we would change the status quo <laughs> on that character yeah uh, no no it's just another layer of it <laughs> yeah i guess so i did want to briefly bring up the thing that we talked about last uh episode which is that lizard seems to have found some new advancement with the isotopic genome accelerator you know the the thing from the first story arc that split spidey in two i you know i've been kind of talking about this in relationship to spider-man and kindred uh, you know uh, like maybe like 20 episodes ago i mentioned that i felt like this thing would might come back but now that we truly know we're at the end of the of spencer's run and this thing is starting to reappear i think that there's going to be greater plans for it you know, if I was a like a betting man and we had these two Harrys running around, uh, I, I would bet maybe that the isotopic genome accelerator might be brought back into the fold to bring those two Harrys back into one person again and maybe resurrect a more classic Harry status quo of him kind of as the Green Goblin, you know, be, being kind of crazy or whatever or however that ends up. Um, and also in the in light of the news, and we're going to talk about this on a future recording, in light of the news of Ben coming back into the role as Spider-Man, I almost wonder maybe if this story ends with, you know, Peter being blasted by it again in some way and losing his powers or having that separated from him that sets up that Ben story. So I, I could see this item being used to basically facilitate both the end of this run and the transition into the next one. Does that like seem like any kind of solid? I know, I know episode 300 revealed you hate my hypothesizing, but 
Uh, <laughs> does that sound like something reasonable to you? I, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's a little, little too MacGuffin-y, Dois Machina kind of, you know, storytelling here. But like, I, uh, you know, it's it's as plausible to me as anything else. But like, yeah, I mean, we're literally just going to like blast blast a bunch, you know, hypothetically blast a bunch of people to, to, to fix the status quo. And it's like, all right, well, you know, I guess if that's what you're going to do, but I, that's not me disagreeing with you. I, I, I agree that it's a reasonable direction it can go in, whether I think that's a good use of storytelling in the last three years of my life. I, that, that I can't say. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I mean, just put a pin in that. I I know some, some people in our Slack were talking about this as well. And, you know, he did set it up all those years ago. So it is floating out there. It's it's definitely Chekhov's, uh, you know, isotopic genome accelerator for sure. Yes. And it wouldn't be the first time anyone's ever used that phrase. So what happens next? So Peter needs to go stop like Jamie and the foreigner. So, of course, there's there's only one natural place he can go other than the Avengers. Goes to Ned Leeds. <laughs> Cheerio, Pip Pip. <laughs> hey, you're alive now. Why don't I reconnect you with the guy that like tried to murder you? you. <laughs> uh, so that's what he does. He goes to get Ned Leeds. I thought also kind of a weird use of pages. Like it's just kind of a lot of exposition being restated, you know, again here. Like if he's going to get Ned Leeds, just have him go get Ned Leeds. Like, I don't know why this was three or four pages of the comic. We're just padding this thing out here. I still don't really know what to make of this whole Ned Leeds thing, but fine. Ned Leeds is going to go. I don't know how he's going to help him, but I guess Ned now has goblin powers. So may- maybe he's got more in him than, than we realize. I'm still kind of struggling with, like, is this really Ned Leeds or is this some some other game of some sort? But, I, I you know, it seems like we're building in the direction that this is truly Ned Leeds from... Amazing Spider-Man 289, even though he was cloned from Dead Ned Lead. So I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know, Dan. I have nothing to add. <laughs> yeah. So back back to our favorite character, the finisher, who is in his like cell slash holographic projection of his apartment. He's like, you know, talking like a bad guy and, and monologuing. And he suddenly turns the hollow projection of his apartment into like something else i couldn't really tell you what it's like a missile command station it's like the set of war games i can't really tell you it's visually confusing and we're supposed to be like really afraid of this i guess like he's like spider-man tried to kill me with a missile well guess what now i'm here to return the favor <laughs> it's, it's quite random and ridiculous and like you said not visually clear at all i mean the, i mean the art art overall in this issue was fine but like this this scene could have could have used a lot more visual clarity for sure for certain so we we return to the palace remember that place it was the casino that's flying over new york city jamie spends a whole page explaining how the clairvoyant works because we the audience need to be reiterated about that which i guess i mean it's been what a year since we've seen this thing but like who is this story for if not people who already know how the clairvoyant works but okay so we reiterate the clairvoyant stuff and cool we get a good i thought at least a funny joke about like asking the clairvoyant what the first question we'd ask is and, and the opening of that kind of like loop uh, of, of thought like, Oh, well that, that is an interesting, you can't really answer that. But I mean, as clever as I thought that was suddenly, Oh no, the jack-o'-lanterns and a bunch of lame villains, including the grizzly attack because they were working for the finisher all along. And what this means, I have no idea. Yeah. The Alliance is here. I mean, Again, it's just like these are all low level characters working for other low level characters. So the betrayals don't really mean much because it's like, OK, well, they, they all, you know, they're all fodder. So what, what, where are we going with this? Like, who cares who's working for who? Like, like, what's the end game here? And I still don't know. I still, we're, we're, we're getting a giant size issue, Dan, and I still don't really know what exactly the conflict is here. Like what 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 is the what needs to be resolved in this in this next comic, Dan? Like, what do we what do we what do we really need to know? Not what what is Nick Spencer telling us we need to know? What do we as fans need to know in this next comic? I don't even know. Like, I don't know why people want the clairvoyant. Like, are they using it to kind of just like gamble and make a bunch of money? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, are they just going to like back to the future to it or something? I mean, is that what's happening here? I mean, I mean, Teresa just wants to get revenge on her partner's death and it's kind of spiraled into something worse, but I'm not sure what, like, because the finisher has not really said what he's trying to do, but apparently he needs the clairvoyant. Uh, like, I'm just like, I'm going to cross eyed just keeping the foreigner and the finisher straight, like, between those two things. Cause the foreigner I thought was like supporting Silver Sable in some regard. It's all over the place. And to make things even more confusing, we now travel to a new place inexplicably with the finisher, where it's revealed that the chameleon considers the finisher his teacher. And then like these doors spill open and it's revealed there's a bunch of other chameleons that like come pouring through the doors, which got me thinking, like, have we ever seen Dimitri's face? Like, I think we've seen maybe parts of it, but have we ever had that reveal? I don't think so. Done? No, I always I always thought his face was blank. They always showed it as blank almost underneath the mask. I don't know. I don't think we've ever truly seen his face. No, I, I feel well, the chameleon is like the lizard where there's no real solid status quo for the character. It's like, oh, the lizard's completely made of brain matter until he's not. So no, the chameleon can transform using a belt device until he can't. He's just a guy who wears masks. So, OK, so there's all these other chameleons that come running out from like behind this door and chameleon recognizes his place. My read on this, and again, I haven't read the giant size issue, even though I know it came out today, is that it's like kind of like a red room, but for chameleons, like that, like there are a bunch of people that have chameleons abilities and they were all trained by the finisher. That that seems to be my read on this, or maybe they're all LMDs and, and we're going to find it that Teresa is just like one of these LMDs wearing like a Teresa mask, like uh, you know, I, I, if that's where we're headed, I don't know. I don't know what this is. I don't know. Like in, in terms of intriguing things, like this was the only part that got me to sit up and go, what? I don't know if it's in a good way, but I was like, all right, maybe we'll get you thinking it. about it, Dan. I'm thinking about it clearly, I, I, but I'm thinking about it in this way, Mark. I'm like, oh boy, a major character is about to be changed. And will be never referred to in this way ever again. <laughs> right, right. As future writers forget that this development happened. That may be a little bit cheeky, but like how often do these like Spider-Man villains get new origins or new parts of their character? And then that's like promptly forgotten. And the lizard being the most obvious case in point. And then, you know, hey, that's the end of the issue. Except nope, Coda with the Sinister War of Otto, like, you know, revive or like, you know, bringing back the Sinister Six. Boy, if you felt like, you know, there might be a change for a character here, you know, here's a change that's made in the most inconsequential way imaginable. I guess as dumb as he died, he is brought back to life in an equally stupid way. And and it's Electro. What do you think about this scene with Otto resurrecting Electro? On one hand, Electro, Max Dillon was kind of written out of the book in, in very kind of like, what? Kind of a way. And, and, and you know, I mean, maybe this is just me, you know, Spencer doing what, yet again, what I was complaining about him doing earlier, which is just fixing something that, you know, he thought needed to be fixed. But, you know, like, I don't mind Electro being brought back. But, you know, if you're going to bring him back, like, like you say, have it mean something. This was like, literally like, and and then on the, and then on the seventh day, there was Electro and here he comes out of a tube. And you're just like, what? Like, like, come on. Like, it's got to be something better than this. <laughs> it's one of those wrinkles that you're like, oh, he like summons him out of the air because Electro is all around us at all times. Like Electro is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> or something you know like make room for the electro at the dance you know the high school dance uh he's between us all it, but it also has like reaching ramifications which will probably be ignored just like uh, any other changes but like if you could kill electro and then just bring him back because all electricity is electro then like who cares about this character anymore like oh he's just in, he's just immortal and I, I you know I, I guess the same was done with Sandman essentially when they like were like oh his soul is in one piece of sand I guess you could still destroy that piece of sand but these characters I feel like are so damaged it's time for another gauntlet yes all right do you want to get the grades <laughs> Dan or, or I mean do you even have a grade. <laughs> 
Uh, B plus. All right, I'm 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 gonna give it the same. You beat me to it. Yeah, I mean this 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 this, this arc is nonsense. I'm sorry, <laughs> it still is. I know I said that last time, and we're like this is better, but it's still nonsense. <laughs> I don't even feel like a good critic talking about this arc because I just like, I don't really want to give it that much thought. You know, it's just like, okay, we're putting toys back in a box or whatever. And there's not even an attempt to tell like a, a compelling story here. So eh, that that's what it is. That's what we're left with Mark. I mean, there have been worse issues of amazing Spider-Man, but not many. I agree with that, Dan. So, well, bring but- us home, Mark. All right, Dan, it's that time, time for all good things to come to an end. So we want to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers for tuning in to this episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. This episode was edited by Rick Coase with production support from Andy Myers. Our artwork comes handcrafted by artists Ron Friends, Sal Buscema, and Ray Sumzer. Our theme songs were produced by Rylan Bojack, Tony Thaxton, and Spider Madge. This episode was originally released on Patreon as a live stream hangout with us back when the comic was first released. So if you'd like to help support our show's continued existence and these reviews while joining us on the live stream, why not head on over to our Patreon and sign up? So Mark, so Mark, until you lather yourself up in lubricant and start robbing banks, what's our motto? Ooh, that's quite the visual, Dan. Our motto, of course, is with great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk. Don't, don't miss the next installment.